You know, people ask me all the time, why do you do this? Why do you not retire and 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 read books and 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 write fancy academic papers? And I say yes, that is also important. But what is more important is that I uh, was given an opportunity to read books in the first place, to engage with ideas because of the sacrifices of ordinary. And so part of scholarship must be given back to the people in the form of public engagement. See myself as a public scholar, uh, what we call uh, an activist scholar or a scholar actor, who's always trying to use the knowledge that is in from reading books, from observing people in their communities, in their society, and giving them back, in the words of a UC Quayana, giving them back to the people as a political nourishment, and by extension, cultural nourishment. That's what I'm about. It's about being that public scholar whose work is not just confined to the classroom, but that classroom is extended to the public space. I'm busy now. Have a root, and it's from way below the surface you bring up your food. Now, Thomas Edison, the light bulb inventor, this 2000 time he failed before the bulb could light. And when, when he reached 67, a fire cost them two million. That's when the studio burned to the ground one December night. But he stood strong, faithful to his craft. And three weeks later, released his first photograph. You see, he had the stuff. Great men are made of. It's the stuff you could miss unless you look. Below the surface, we are the stuff. Great men are made of. It is the stuff you could miss unless you look below the surface. <laughs> They say that pressure, you get diamonds out of rock. And it's the same with the human character when our dreams are dumb struck. In a jail, two men looking out through the same bars. One will fail, cause he see mud while the other sees stars. So while pressure humbles the meek, it strengthens who go this see. It's the barometer that measures the strong and the weak. Martin Luther and South Africa Nelson Mandela. Got this in their jail cell could dim their lights. And see the root and it's from way below the surface. You bring up your food. Now Thomas Edison. The light bulb inventor. This 2000 time he failed before the bulb could light. And when, when he reached 867, 
A fire cost them two million. That's when the studio burned to the ground one December night. But he stood strong, faithful to his craft. And three weeks later, releases his photograph. You see the other stuff. Great men are made of. It's the stuff you could miss. Unless you look below the surface, we are the stuff. Great men are made of. It's the stuff you could miss. Unless you look below the surface. <laughs> They say that pressure, you get diamonds out of rock. And it's the same with the human character when our dreams are done struck. In a jail, two men looking out through the same bars. One will fail, cause he see mud while the other sees stars. So while pressure humbles the meek, it strengthens who do this see. It's the barometer that measures the strong and the weak. Martin Luther and South Africa Nelson Mandela. That this in their jail cell could dim their lights. And civil rights atrocities. Only few will more energies. For the more injustice rages the more they fight. And for 27 years, Nelson Mandela suffered, and from jail became president of South Africa. You know why? He had the stuff. Great men are made of. It's the stuff you can miss unless you look below the surface. He had the stuff. Great men are made Fall asleep on a Canadian lawn. He couldn't make it back home after training. He was too tired to go on. Stephen Ames at age seven, he was on the golf pot. Brian Lara came to live his dream while only a little tot. Out of gold and show them world class last year. Coming back from the club despair, his recovery he couldn't quit. The causer's vision was clear. Michael Jordan, Bulls, basketball superstar. In high school, he was kicked off the basketball team. And take a record and label. One set to the Beatles. We don't like your song and group with the cars. I yesterday dream. But he made song, they compose and rhyme. And today they are the greatest pop group of our time. Because they had the stuff. Great men are made of. It's the stuff you can miss. Unless you look below the surface, I see the other stuff. The great men are made of is the stuff you can miss. Unless you look below the surface. <laughs> As a 
nation we with the well to train our young. But to adopt a luck and chance approach or a game in disposition. For they will dream of easy money and sweet tomorrow. From a catch with scheme with a one in one hundred thousand ratio. We need to build foundations of truth. Trees that send down good roots. Not parasites that sucks at them got roots. Albert Einstein couldn't even speak till he was four. Couldn't read a line until he was seven years old. And his teachers call him a drifter, an unsociable dreamer. Soon he was expelled and kicked off the road. Nevertheless, he remained a strong up the list. And today he's known as the greatest of physicists. You know why? He had the stuff. Great men are made of. Is the stuff you can miss unless you look below the surface? Oh, he had the stuff. Great, great man I made of. Is the stuff you can miss unless you look below the surface? <laughs> right here oh yes good evening to you welcome to another edition of politics 101 coming in this evening the voice there of the mystic prowler roy lewis born in st kitts sorry st vincent uh, but of course like so many um, of our bards, our Calypsonians. They went to Trinidad and made Trinidad their home. And um, Mystic Prowler winning the Calypso Monarch in 1998, doing for us there uh, below the surface. Uh, great, the stuff that great men and women are made of. Sometimes you don't see it unless you look below the surface. So many of our great, great people from our Caribbean, our Guyana, started in humble circumstances and they rose to tremendous heights. Sometimes we didn't know it until they got there um, because they were endowed with the stuff that great men are made of, great women are made of. We in Guyana, of course, we are blessed. You know, my colleague, late colleague Andaye used to say one of the problems with Guyana is we produce too many great men and women. Uh, one generation, when you think of uh, a generation that produced Burnham and Jagan and Quayan and Martin Carter, Winnie Fred Gaskin, James Phillips Gay, Rory Westmus, um, uh, Janet Jagan, all in one generation. And when you think that all of them belong to this political party, you imagine sitting around a table, Jagan, Burnham, Kwayana, Martin Carter, Rory Westmus, Lachman Singh, Jaina Ryan Singh, Janet Jagan, James Phillips Gay, Winifred Gaskin. You imagine all of them sitting around a table. What kind of meeting that 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 would have been? You know, then you come to the next generation that produce the Walter Rodneys and Clive Thomas and Rupert Rupnerine and Josh Ramsamy and, and, and all of that generation. I, I, I had the opportunity of being in meetings with all of them sitting around the table and Dai and Bonita Harris and so on. 
and you marveled, you marveled because they were all such talented people. God bless our country. God bless our country. God bless our region, the Caribbean. Um, we fight among ourselves and so sometimes we don't realize how richly endowed we have been and we continue to be. If only we could join all of those forces, all of those brains together. Oh, what a wonderful, what a wonderful place um, we would continue to be. We are still a great country, a great region, despite the fact that we, all our talents don't always come together. I have been talking in recent times. Tomorrow, Kwayan is going to be 99. He is the only one left of that generation. All those names that I call there, they've all gone to the great beyond. He's the only one still alive. He's the only one still alive. You know, and I've been talking, uh, you know, one of the great periods of our political history uh, was the period from 19, uh, 1964, thereabout, when the PNC first came to power. And the early 1970s, when Kwayan and Barnum broke politically. But those seven years, when they were in partnership, um, uh, really saw some of the great feats. And I was making the point this morning that we, um, Dr. Ptolemy Reed, yes, somebody's reminding me, Dr. Reed, although he's of that generation, he came into politics much later. Um, uh, come into party. He's of, he's of that generation, Burnham's generation and Kwayana and, and them. And in 1953, when they, when they took power, uh, you know, limited though it was, they were all young men and women. Jagan was the oldest. He, no, J.P. Latchman Singh was older than Jagan. But they were 35. Burnham was 30. Kwayana was uh, 28. Martin Carter was 25. They were babies, um, but they, they were bold enough. They were bold enough to take up the mantle and to open up possibilities for us, our independence. We are a blessed country. We are a blessed country. I know because of the state of our politics, People on this side don't like to hear good things about Jagan. And people on the other side don't like to hear good things about Burnham. But that is our loss. That is our loss. That is our loss. That is our loss. That we are not able to speak in one breath about our great pioneers. I don't like to use the term father of the nation, you know, because I think it's a silly it's a silly term, and it it it, it hides a lot. Um, so I, I I don't deal with the fathers of the nation, pioneers of our independence movement, pioneers, pioneers of our independence movement. You know, it was it was it was the the whole notion of the cooperative republic came through a conversation between Burnham and Kwayana that went like this. Uh, Sydney, uh, we are, uh, I'm thinking about uh, becoming a republic. Forbes, what kind of republic are you thinking about? A banana republic? <laughs> well, um, what do you think? Well, what do you think about, uh, 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 Forbes, what do you think about cooperatives? Cooperatives, they are grounded in our history. What about a cooperative republic? Okay, Sydney, I'll think about it. One week later, Mr. Burnham addresses the nation and we are becoming a republic and ours shall be the cooperative republic. A simple conversation between two men. And that is the kind of history that is sometimes lost on our people. You know, because we reduce everything to the bipolar, you know, Jagan and Burnham, we, we miss the phalanx of energy and talent 
that made Burnham and Jagan what they were and what they are. And I just give you an example there of what partnership, partnership could, could do, could do. I hope some of the young PNC people are listening and them, for them to understand that ours shall be um, ours shall be a cooperative republic. It is the stuff that great men are made of, and that you don't always know the origins unless you look beneath the surface. Tomorrow we're going to be celebrating Kwayana's 99 birthday. I'm going to have a panel on. And we are going to be talking because you cannot talk about Burnham and Jagan in isolation from the larger team that they were part of. It's no accident that Aquiana wrote the party song for the PPP, the PNC, the WPA. It is no accident that Aquiana was the deputy editor and chief writer of the Thunder, which was the PPP's paper. And then he was the editor of New Nation. He was the assistant general secretary of the PPP and the general secretary of the PNC. And if the WPA had an office called general secretary, I'm sure he would have been the general secretary of the WPA. So he was the chief writer, deputy editor, if you will, of the Thunder, editor of the New Nation, he was the editor of Day Clean and Open Word, the WPA papers. And you in the audience are asking, I said, but I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Because sometimes we fall into the trap of believing that things happen in isolation. Good evening and welcome to Politics 101 tonight. Tonight we are going to be talking about GCOM. Tonight we're going to be talking about GCOM. The, the, you know that those hearings before, before the uh, United Nations Human Rights widespread hearings, and you pick up the newspapers every day, and you're seeing snippets of the report that was uh, written by that committee. A very informed report, because often we think that these talk shops produce nothing. And part of that report is a report on GCOM, on GCOM. The, um, the committee said GCOM makeup is not democratic. And I want to read part of the report. In its report published last month, the UN committee noted that while it welcomes effort, efforts made to amend the electoral laws to advance the smoother election process in Guyana, the structural makeup of the country's electoral machinery, GCOM, still lacks inclusivity. While it notes the improvements in the electoral process, the committee outlined in its report that it remains, and I quote, concerned that the electoral system is exacerbating the existing dual ethnopolitical polarization and contributing to the political marginalization of ethnic minorities and indig indigenous people. I have Vincent Alexander, as you can see here tonight. He's our go-to man on these matters. He's our go-to man on, on a lot of matters, but um, this is one of his babies. And when you read, when you read what the UN committee has said there, you 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 kind of a little bit in shock. Because it's so difficult, and I'm bringing Vincent in, it's so difficult to hear that kind of straight, unvarnished talk. You know, when you read the Stabrook News or you read the Opinion Shapers, you know they dance around 
Uh, well, well, well. These people are saying that GCOM, the machinery, if it's not fixed, it's not only that it will produce bad elections, but it will exacerbate our racial problems. First of all, they tell us in Guyana we don't have racial, we don't have a racial problem. You listen to some of the PNC leaders, you listen to all of the PPP leaders. Oh, Guyana doesn't have a racial problem. They don't talk about it. When they talk about GCOM, they talk about GCOM isolated as though elections and got nothing to do with race. But here is the white people. Let me let me read it again for y'all. Let me read it again for y'all. Let me read it again for y'all. It noted. It noted. Let me let me let, let me let me let me let me let me um let me find let me find the correct passage that I read just now. So you all can hear it. Not, I am not saying it. This is what the United Nations Human Rights Committee is saying. It is saying that if the problem is not solved, then we are going to exacerbate our racial and ethnic problems our racial and ethnic problems. That is what they are saying. Vincent Alexander, good evening and welcome again to Politics 101. Good Vincent, evening. Welcome to you and all of the viewers. Thank you very much. Vincent, when you read the report that was produced there by the United Nations Committee and the white race and the linkages that it is making between GCOM and the larger problems in the society. Something that you have been yelling, crying, quarreling about. And some people I'm sure are saying, oh, well, Alexander is a madman. When you read what those people have said in their report, what goes through your mind? Well, <laughs> in, in many regards, they have um, said exactly what some of us would have been saying in, in different words. The fact of the matter is they have raised the fundamental question of our democracy. And I dare say that state adjicum is both a microcosm, a reflection of the state of our democracy. Therefore, for me, when one seeks to uh, address this matter, one has to look at the entire political uh, landscape. And I am of the view that the first problem we have is that culturally, political or political culture has not in fact embraced democracy. Um, some people refer to what we have as an electoral democracy. And even that, even that is highly, highly dysfunctional. So that really fundamental question is, how do we in fact, uh, construct a democracy in Guyana, and in so doing, have it reflected in the various institutions of the state, GCOM being one such institution. And uh, I would seek to offer that the biggest problem we are faced with is the problem of our political culture and that a resolution of the problem in relation to Chicom and democracy at large, largely has to do with our 
political culture. And um, hopefully during the course of our discussions, I will demonstrate the fault lines in a GCOM as presently constituted. I will also try to refer to what I think um, are the jeopardies uh, that we have, which are associated with the wider political culture that we have to address if we're going to address the question of a GCOM that is democratic. And when we talk about the GCOM that's democratic, we really have to talk about the GCOM that one reflects the general interests of the people of Guyana. That is a GCOM that uh, can, in fact, uh, produce free, fair, and um, a re an election with the absence of fear. Free fear and free of fear <laughs> uh, elections. That is what we have to achieve in order to achieve what may be considered to be um, a democratic institution. And for us to do that, it depends on the composition of the body, it depends on the modus operandi of the body. And I dare say, that's where we fall down. We fall down in terms of the composition and in terms of the modus operandi in the context of our political culture, which is far from democratic. Our political culture, which is far from democratic. Vincent, you have ventured into an area that I think is very deep, and it's one that we do not talk about very often, because we throw wrong this word democracy so glibly that people take it for granted that we are a democratic state, we have a democratic state, we have a democratic polity, um, democracy flows from all the streams in Guyana, it's on all the road. And in a sense, you are asking a very important question, raising a very important question there. What, what would you say is the source of that tenuous relationship with uh, democracy that is so much part of our political behavior because political culture is really some total of our political behavior what is it about our 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 evolution as a post-colonial state well one has to go back to to colonization because there's a relationship between the post-colonial and the colonial what is it about our evolution as a polity that makes the democratic behavior, certainly at the level of governance, what is it that makes it so difficult for us to hold on, hold on to that um, notion of a democratic political culture? Well, first of all, we don't have a history of a yep. democratic political culture. Uh, we were a colony for being a colony in a sense, we were uh, an extension of the empire with um, people who uh, populated uh, the country not being considered as people. And, and that takes us right down to the root of the question of democracy. Because when we talk about the democracy in the very first instance, what we are talking about is a system where the people, uh, through some mechanism, participatory, inclusionary, or otherwise, are able to be the ones who are, in fact, ultimately making the decisions about public affairs and their own livelihood. And certainly, uh, slavery did not facilitate that. And uh, the post-emancipation period did not facilitate that either, because what the post-emancipation period sought to do is a continued exploitative uh, relationship, um, though people were said no longer to be uh, in, in, enslaved. And what has happened in many regards is that the national psyche 
national psyche has been influenced by that ongoing uh, approach to governance that was authoritarian. That's, that has influenced the national psyche. Uh, in a manner where people have come to see uh, rulership and, and governance and so forth as uh, the imposition of the will of a minority, the imposition of the will of the leaders on the people at large. And so even the circumstances where uh, leadership might be considerate, it is a leadership that imposes. And also our history has caused us to see politics as an art of outmaneuvering, the art of uh, controlling, the art of acquiring power, and not an art of relating to the people and delivering to the people based on what is required by them, which is what a democracy really speaks about. So we have really come through uh, a system that has not in fact introduced us uh, to anything democratic. And unfortunately, that has become a part of our own sake. So that if you talk to Guyanese about politics, they, they see politics as outmaneuvering each other. They don't see politics as a system that seeks to control public affairs in the interest of the people. It's a system of how do I uh, insert myself, assert myself, and in so doing, the people may be beneficiaries, but um, very often, it is not the people and them being beneficiaries that drives behavior pattern, it is the old question of, well, politics is about acquiring power, asserting oneself, and uh, very often self-serving, self-serving in the sense of uh, being the custodian of power and using power as one deems and sees, sees fit. And, and that is what permeates uh, our, our system. Of course, we got independence, and therefore, um, having gotten independence, we were no longer a colony, but that didn't mean that the way we saw politics changed. Uh, we became a republic, significance of which many people do not quite understand. Because when we were independent, we were still not sovereign. <laughs> we're still not sovereign meaning that the people still did not have ultimate control. You were still, uh, to a very large extent, a part of the British Empire, with the Queen being the head of state. And we know that in uh, the British Empire, it's not the people who were seen to be sovereign, it was the Queen who was seen to be sovereign, therefore the one making the ultimate decisions. It became a republic, which should really signify a transformation from those in rulership uh, being the ones making ultimate decisions to the people themselves uh, through a system of uh, representative democracy, inclusionary democracy, being able uh, to have their hands on the wheels of, this, of, of the state rather than a few individuals. But when you talk to us, average Guyanese, that's not the way we see politics, and it's largely a question of uh, who's in control, to whose benefit, rather than uh, politicians being servants of, of the people. And this is exactly what we see in our agencies and in GCOM in particular, as we discuss GCOM. As we discuss GCOM, in case you're just joining us, we are talking here about the United Nations Human Rights Committee's report on Guyana and their emphasis on the state of play at GCOM. 
Vincent part of the report says this. Let me read it here for you and get your comment. The committee said it is concerned about the partisan structure of GCOM, including members, um, excluding members from other parties and indigenous peoples. And therefore, it, in its view, impeding it from effectively and independently implementing its mandate. Comment. Well, I don't know that they necessarily understand the problem that we are faced with. Uh, of course, they have recognized that we don't get results <laughs> that are desirable. I don't think they completely understand the problem. I say that to say, I don't think the mere inclusion other parties will necessarily uh, change things at Chico. And, and let me give a demonstration of why I say so. We presently have the situation in Parliament where one party occupies a seat as a part of the arrangement that um, came out of the joint. And we have that parliamentarian, <laughs> so-called, now commandeering that seat in the face of an understanding that she should be the making office. And as she does that, we have patent silence from other parties and from the ruling party in particular, which suggests that though she, or stands, though she represents uh, another party and another group being involved, that that is ostensibly so. That in fact, uh, there seem to be some understanding <laughs> between her and the ruling party that allows her to behave in the way in which she behaves, starting with taking the position of deputy uh, speaker to the National Assembly. So the point that I'm making is that we have a society that is tremendously fractured and tremendously partisan, even in the instance when we purport to be of civil society. And that we don't have a society where if you go to different uh, organizations and pull them together, that you will necessarily get a representation of the will of, of the people or uh, a body of people addressing uh, the good of the people. And I say that because if one looks across uh, even our civil society, one would see that the problem of the political culture is evident in those bodies as well. Whether it's we've had problems with football, we've had problems with cricket, we've had problems with athletics, almost every civil society organization we have had problems with. Even our good even our good human rights organization. We have had problems in terms of uh, the leadership and uh, upon whom shoulders, upon whom shoulders they stand. So I, I, I don't think a solution to our problem is merely um, expanding the, the involvement of, 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 of others, because very often in our society, when we have uh, these agencies and institutions, the people who end up being there turn out to be proxies mm -hmm. for political parties, turn out to be proxies for political parties, so that we have got to address a more fundamental issue, and which is our own commitment uh, to democracy, and probably, probably have to put in place the kind of stringent rules and regulations uh, 
that are highly uh, justiciable with uh, the possibility of a judiciary, for example, stepping in to, to give um, redress where things uh, go wrong. Because in our present system, even the judiciary is handicapped by our, our legal mechanisms. For example, we have a representation of the People's Act that suggests, as we experience, that even in the instance where you're able to discern that the system is flawed and is producing a result that is not fair, that you endorse that result on some contention that that matter should be addressed in a petition. So we see where our legal system uh, facilitates to a large extent uh, on democratic uh, society. And so if we contend that we ourselves are cultured in a way, then it would occur to me that what we need in the first instance is a framework that pushes against uh, our culture and that that framework, legal and otherwise, becomes a new source of culturation so that we could behave uh, differently. And I, I would suggest that if we were to be behaving differently, even without the change of some of or other laws, um, our situation will be completely different. And I want to reference this problem across the board. You look, for example, at the composition of the Local Government Commission. We end up allowing the politicians to populate the commission rather than so-called civil society. So you, you see structurally, we, we're not uh, working on inclusion. Structurally, we are facilitating the domination of a, a small group of people. And when they bring that culture to bear that I talked about, then everything goes awry. And that's the problem with GCOM. Structurally, at a time when probably it was prudent to do so, we made up a commission that essentially was supposed to reflect the uh, major political players. But you know what? In that composition, we created instruments which says that these people, though nominated, are not necessarily representatives of the political parties. These nuances sometimes we don't quite understand. Mm -hmm. Nominated. But the fact that we are insulated from being uh, removed by a political party suggests that we are put there for the integrity, <laughs> for the competence, for the knowledge that we can bring to bear on elections. But we have our political leaders who have said, quite recently it's been said, by the, the vice president, that we know GCOM is a political body because look how it is made up. But the fact of the matter is, when we uh, created a situation where the parties merely nominate, the president appoints and the parties cannot remove, just creating a mechanism that could be nonpartisan. But then I ask the question, how is it and why is it? For example, since I'm a commissioner, I have seen at least four or five commissioners in mid office on the side of the People's Progressive Party's nominees. And that, that raises a flag and, 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 and suggests that the spirit of, of the commission is, is not at work because People are removed and, and nobody knows why, for what reason. They, well, I shouldn't say nobody knows. I think many of us know, but it is not public knowledge mm -hmm. why these people are removed. So it suggests 
that there are mechanisms that even seek to undermine the intent. And that we have those mechanisms has a lot to do with the way in which we see governance and the way in which we see politics. And so I'm getting back to this point that the way in which we see these things has got to be changed. It's kind of a chicken and egg situation in the sense that I'm also saying, you know, probably uh, some legal and structural mechanisms may restrain or constrain our political behavior. Therefore, over time, we may get to where we want to get to. But I contend it's not merely a question of repopulating uh, the Elections Commission as much as it's not merely a question of repopulating the Constitution, the, uh, the local government commission or the public service commission or the teaching service commission, all of our bodies are faced with the problem that GCOM is faced with. The magnitude of GCOM might be greater in that we don't change persons uh, over time, they're there after life. But I think that the problem is evident all of our constitutional bodies. And the, major, the major issue really is the political culture and the fact that the politicians are allowed uh, to determine the composition of those bodies. And in doing so, they ensure that the people who they put uh, are people who are partisan and people who are in cahoots from the political perspective. Vincent, we, we have the formula there that is called the Carter Price formula of three people from the opposition, three from the government. And I, and, and, and I just want to point out that the opposition formula, um, sometimes it's lost on the wider population. We have on the opposition side, really two parties represented or um, uh, if you can put it that way, loosely, because as you said, um, they were they were nominated by the opposition. But you have of the three commissioners, um, two people, yourself and Mr. Corbyn, can be said to be associated with the PNC, and um, Desmond Trotman um, associated with the WPA. That really the opposition leader consults with the parliamentary opposition in making nominations um, to the commission. So in some regards, the opposition side has more representation or wider representation, if you will, um, than the government side that may be lost on the UN people as they were um, uh, making their comments. But the, the Carter formula has three opposition, three um, government um, nominees and a chairperson. Um, is that formula um, a, a sustainable uh, or is it a, a formula that we need to get, to get rid of? And if we get rid of it, what do we replace it with? Let me tell you what's my problem. Yeah. With the formula. Well, not with the formula, with the situation. Mm. I've been speaking to that problem from the inception. In the commission, we have what may be said to be wolves in wolf clothing. So we, we know clearly where these people stand and that they are wolves and they're clothed to a large extent as wolves. My concern is that given the nature of our society, we may end up with wolves in the clothing of the sheep. That's my concern. That changing the manner of appointment will not necessarily end up with people who are nonpartisan because we have seen in other institutions where people are supposed to be nonpartisan, that the methodology for the appointment of those people, uh, that the methodology allows for the political actors to still control who ends, who ends up in those places. And they obviously put people 
do you think uh, partisan? So that, that's where I think we have a very, very uh, big problem. Um, one of the possible saving moments would be if we ended up with a chairperson who is nonpartisan. Because if we end up with a chairperson who is nonpartisan, then the chances are to a large extent the chairperson will moderate and we can still get decisions that are not necessarily partisan decisions. And I would be bold to say that having served on the commission for an extended period, that under the chairmanship of sewage body, mm -hmm. not a perfect deal. I don't know, I would say it's absolutely nonpartisan, but certainly under sewage body, we had a system where there was an attempt from the chair to moderate and to arrive at consensus. And therefore the commission better served its purpose. For whatever reason, uh, as we are presently constituted, I cannot attest to that partisan, nonpartisan chairmanship. And therefore we get back to a reflection of the problem which I am uh, referring to. I think, however, we can try in terms of change to look at the manner in which the Jamaicans have approached this problem. And what the Jamaicans have done, they have attempted to identify a commission that is largely uh, nonpartisan, people from uh, civil society, but they have inserted politicians with a veto. So why is the politicians can't make the decision if they think it's against their interest, then they could veto the decision. So that in a sense, you still are responsive to our fractional politics, not in a way in which they impose themselves in terms of decision-making, but they, they uh, look after their own interests by virtue of uh, the two. And I think that that's probably uh, the direction in which we can go, even as we look at some other legal mechanisms with the uh, dominance of partisan, uh, partisan uh, behavior. I think that's the way to go. And I want to go back again to the um, Development Commission, which for me is a reflection of the same problem, the big disappointment. You may know that I worked uh, eight years in the Development Reform, but left before we heard the next. I never thought that the Government Commission should be comprised the manner in which it has been. My view was that one looks at what's local government and to have the stakeholders in the commission. So for example, local government speaks about law, you have the legal people represent. Local government speaks about uh, health, you have the health people represented. The whole government speaks about manpower, you have the manpower people represented. And so you go down the line of real stakeholders. And then, yes, you may have uh, politicians represented as well. But you have a spectrum there of people who are stakeholders of this body called the local authority and can bring to the table their technical and professional perspectives rather than a political perspective. We didn't do that. And so I'm saying that when you talk elections and you want to look at the real populated, then you have to look at it from that perspective as well. There's much about law in elections, therefore probably the legal profession should be represented. There's much about management. And so the people in management should also be uh, represented. Given the nature of society, then probably we should look at <laughs> probably we should look at ethnic representation, probably. 
and, and some political representation. This is not, um, this is the top of the head kind of suggestion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the point I'm trying to make is that you can find a way in which people who have a real interest outside of the politics per se, who can populate these bodies and bring to bear their professional knowledge and skills and expertise in the decision-making process, rather than having commissioners who largely look over their backs and politicians and determine how is it they act. And, you know, I would go further to say that, notwithstanding my own contention, the society is highly uh, partisan, that we do have a few instances where um, people have behaved in a professional manner, and we should strive to involve such people in our politics. Um, I, I, I think, for example, I would give a tribute, pay tribute to Commissioner Moim Magoon, I think he's deceased, I'm not sure. Yes, yes, he's deceased. Uh, the manner in which he conducted himself uh, as a commissioner at a critical moment in the life of, of our elections. So we saw that there, there is some potential that people can, some people can in fact, and um, given the new framework, new recomposition, over time you may be able to get um, Vincent Alexander Carlton Beckles, I, I hope you got your answer there. Vincent, you reference the Jamaican model. Um, I don't know how much you have um, studied that model. I haven't um, really studied it. Uh, but how often, if you if you are aware, how often have the political parties used the veto that they have? Another way that they have. Another way that they have. Uh -huh. If they have is, is confidential and, and, and private. In okay. fact, um, in fact, Jamaica has a number of lessons, and again, it starts beyond the commission, with the wider society. We know the violence that um, that used to visit. <laughs> Jamaican politics and elections, yes. real, real violence. Yeah, the, and, garrison, um, the garrison politics, yeah. uh, you know, where it was entrenched. To some extent, they started to solve the problem by a reduction of that kind of rivalry outside of the commission. Uh -huh. And then uh, the way in which they made up the commission uh, gave some confidence to the people outside that there was no need for them to behave the way that they were behaving. So I, I, I think there's a lot in terms of the acculturation of the state facing the Jamaican society that has um, that can be a lesson uh, for us uh, here in Vienna. We know that relatively there's still uh, garrisons in, 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 in Jamaica, but they have somehow reposed confidence uh, in their commission probably because they feel that the commission is fair in what it does. And that fairness has to do with the manner in which it is constituted and with the framework in which it operates. You, you, you reference um, also this source Bali approach. Um, and I remember a couple of years ago getting a call out of the blues from Dr. Source Bali. And he said he hunted around, got my number, uh, um, something I'd written or something like that. But he wanted to make that point to me that he only used the casting vote once, he said, um, in his entire tenure. And as you testified that he, whenever there was an impasse, he didn't use the casting vote. He um, ensured that there was consensus. And so he forced the two sides um, to consensus. Um, we have had a lot of comments and a lot of controversy over the current um, chairperson. Uh, it is no secret that uh, in uh, recent times, and by recent times I mean over the last three years at least, she has tended to vote with one side, meaning the government side, more than the other side. Um, and that has raised a lot of eyebrows. 
It, it, do you do you uh, um, think that? Uh, and you talk about legislation. You are a person who is um, very au fait with the law. Um, uh, do you think it's time to, um, if you will, uh, in a sense, legalize the sewage body approach? M you know, um, uh, uh, make it make it make it part of the law um, uh, that governs uh, GCOM. Well, um, that's an interesting uh, proposition. Um, he sought consensus. Um, I don't know that you could, you should legalize consensus in the sense that. Um, well, I'm thinking more about taking away the casting vote from the no. table, which is which is the no. same thing. But but anyhow, go ahead. The casting vote is not a critical vote. It's 3-3. Three, three. Yes. The chairperson is a commissioner. The chairperson has a vote in the first round. The chairperson hasn't had to use a casting vote. Oh. <laughs> what, ah. what, is, what happened in Suresh Bali time? He never used the vote. He never used the vote. I got you. Got you. I got consensus. You. Yes. Yes. So, um, you know, the chairperson doesn't use the casting she, she uses the vote. She uses the original vote. So it's as if it's 4 right. 3. Now, let me say this. And again, it has to do with political culture. I, I, I am not sure that there isn't a regime of fear and concern that. has determined the manner of behavior of the chairperson. I'm not sure it is not that. Right, right. I, I know that during this series by the latter days, that there may have been elements of that at work, which elements led to him emitting. Limited office. office. So body limited office. Yes, office. yes. And he demitted office, I think, because there were forces that were at work that created fear. And he felt more comfortable out of the system. Yes. Rather than being subjected to that 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 ongoing fear. And I think this has been a part of our politics, and um, uh, like I said, how many commissioners demitted office? These were constitutional people. The constitution did not provide for them to have to demit office, the way in which they did, but they did. And so I, I'm seeing somewhere over there mechanisms other than constitutional and other mechanisms that there to keep people in line, or if they're not in line for them to get out. And I, I sense that um, current chairperson may well be uh, a victim of those circumstances, because uh, I would suggest that there is a, there will, at some point in time, there's a radical change in her behavior, in her behavior pattern. And that there must have been forces that have influenced change. Vincent Alexander, there, um, uh, quite an interesting answer. Um, uh, uh, Vincent, of course, is saying that um, there is outside pressure. So, Vincent, when we talk about reform at GCOM, how, how do you how do you respond to that? What reform? Would you suggest um, that could really raise the bar at GCOM and move it towards a more democratic institution? I would be inclined to look at the administration and to seek to find mechanisms to ensure that even in the face of the current commission, that we have administrators who are 
professional and that that has to come through the stringent system of recruitment. Uh, we had suggested previously that given the nature of the commission, that we should engage professional human resource persons to conduct the recruitment process because uh, it is blatant that we have recruited officers who have not met uh, the requirements which we ourselves have spelled out and recruited them because they have found favor with one or the other side mm -hmm. at one time or the other. So for me, if we can get a system that allows for a professional outfit at Chico, starting with the CEO downwards, then we may be able to conduct our elections in a manner that can have uh, confidence of the, the people. We have seen a tremendous effort to ensure that certain persons were placed in those positions in the face of them not meeting our own stipulated requirements, both our chief and our, our, our deputy. And one could see how that, that, that unfolded. Mm -hmm. you know, for example, um, <coughs> the Jamaican guy, in my humble opinion, and I think anyone who looks at the documentation, is far more qualified. But first of all, he met the basic requirements, which the other guy did not meet, and was far more qualified, but we didn't opt for him. I thought that that was a glorious opportunity mm -hmm. to have someone who was not Chinese, who could start off by being seen as being nonpartisan, in charge of our election machinery. What didn't happen? Did not so we need mechanisms in the, the a change in the administration, the way in which we identify our professional staff uh, could make a difference, even in the face. Because at the end of the day, much of what uh, could be done on the ground is facilitated by the administrative uh, staff. Of course, there are other things that ought to be um, changed that the commission has some impact on. But we don't have an administration that stands up to the commission uh, in that regard. You need an administration that could freshly say to the commission, we are the experts, this is how it works. And it has nothing to do with the political favor. Mm -hmm. at, at, at present, the commissioners hire the staff. The, the constitution provides for the commissioners to hire staff. Commissioners uh, do uh, actually hire the senior management staff. They have delegated the responsibility for the junior staff to the CEO. But here again, you have the problem. If you have someone uh, whom you have question marks, and you delegated that person in terms of recruiting at the lower level, then it's the entire system becomes corrupt. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, how about if the um, the power to hire uh, is taken out of the hands of the commissioners, and um, uh, there is some uh, quote unquote nonpartisan body that does the hiring? That was partly our suggestion that we should bring in a number of. Um, we would set the criteria, so yes. the commission doesn't lose its authority. You set right. the criteria. For the purpose of impartiality, you, you go there, you get nonpartisan professional people, and let them be the ones to screen the applicants and to determine who fits the bill. It's a proposition that's on the table that has been um, refused by a partial by a partial commission. Partial commission because you mean four out of seven. Yes. Uh huh. 
Vincent, the, um, if we go back to the CARICOM report, um, it was quite explicit that uh, the, um, the GCOM is not in its present state, cannot deliver um, the kind of democratic elections, notwithstanding the conclusions they came to regarding the 2020 elections. They were very clear that GCOM, I mean, it was a contradiction, but they were very clear. The EU report also um, cast doubts on the, the ability of GCOM in its present state to deliver democratic elections. Now we have the UN committee basically taking the same position. What next then for GCOM? Well, <laughs> um, today, incidentally, <laughs> Constitutional Reform Commission was appointed. Uh -huh. And uh, clearly one of the issues that should be addressed is our electoral system. And uh, in that regard, GCOM as well. So I, I think we have to turn our attention to the work of the Constitutional Reform Commission and the extent to which we have not been infected in the way in which all of our commissions are infected mm -hmm. so we can have a fairly uh, objective and professional job that produces uh, recommendations for constitutional reform that would be embraced by the parliament mm -hmm. embraced by the parliament we know that on the last occasion, even what was embraced by the parliament, some of it did not come to fruition. And that had to do with the will. I would say <coughs> of the executive or the executives. So that I think you have to turn the constitution reform this time and to try to reflect the will of the people rather than have our political culture continue to impose the will of the political actors in defiance of even the thinking of their own supporters. Even the thinking of their own supporters. Vincent, um, <clears throat> this quote from the UN committee said it is concerned that the electoral system is exacerbated. Wow the existing dual, <clears throat> dual ethno-political polarization and contributing to the political marginalization of other ethnic minorities and indigenous peoples. Right, you've raised another question there now, that is our organic politics. Um, the electoral system shows up what organic politics uh, represents. Indeed, in a plural society like ours, um, there should be an uh, effort to have uh, more inclusion in the governance process. And there are various ways in which that could be achieved. In the first instance, the very system of the party list inhibits the kind of inclusion and participation that will all go well. We have a system where we have 65 seats, 40 of which are determined solely by the party, and I could dare say by its leader. 40 of those. We have another 25 that are also initially determined who candidates are uh, by the party. Uh, my own view is that in terms of our electoral system, there is a need for as many constituencies as possible with the top up being there for that purpose. 
top of means top of we've topped up with 40 seats. And the difference over the elections has never been more than five seats. We top up with 40. There's no need for that. So we can have more constituencies, more parliamentarians who are identified with constituencies, not necessarily being party candidates, but individuals being able to run in constituencies as well. And that way you start to spread representation of people in terms of people they have confidence in, rather than us being forced to back one or the other or the minor, minor part. So I think that that's where we can start this process, the very way in which we constitute our parliament. We need to move away from this list system, open list, even where we use a list, we don't say to people who is picking order, mm -hmm. we need to move away from that create more constituencies, allow freer participation at the constituency level, allow a large number of constituencies, use top-up for the purposes intended to give us a proportional result, and not to continue to impose upon the people, uh, parliamentarians, that's one. Secondly, I think that uh, in our parliament itself, there is a need for certain decisions to be subject to um, a super majority. In other words, there shouldn't be a case where you just uh, 50 and 1 make certain decisions. It should be a, a larger number so that we push for dialogue and consensus in the decision uh, making, making process so that uh, the voice of others could be heard in the decision-making process rather than what now pertains, where it is the voice of the, <laughs> the governing party that, that is heard. And outside of the parliament, you know, constitutional bodies, again, in terms of decision-making, we should probably look at mechanisms. Like that. You, may, you may maintain the same composition, but look for a consensus as a basis for decision-making rather than mere uh, majority. I would go even further than that to argue that um, given the plurality of our society, uh, given the history of our society, given the recognition in 1953 of the need for the ethnic groups to work together, Given the recognition in 1977, well, before 77, I think after 53, Jagan on occasions offered uh, for a uh, unity government. Uh, in 1977, there were talks about the unity government. In 1985, there were talks about the unity government. Is recognition, there has been recognition that we have a problem. And um, therefore, I think that we should try to work at as well. Um, one of the things that has been put into the, the law in relation to constitutional reform is that one of the problems we address is the ethnic problem. I think here we have another opportunity to configure a governance system that allows for the participation of the parties in government in a manner where they have a consensual program, not just bodies, a consensual program, so that we have a situation where we're governing uh, for all of the people based on their elected representatives. I think that uh, if we were to allow our local government system to work, where we look at the possibility of not interfering in the operation of local bodies, having local bodies uh, probably elected purely on constituency basis rather than what we presently use, allowing for subsidiarity, allowing for us to conclude what authority should be exercised by local authorities based on uh, what they can best do 
and allocating state resources in addition to their own revenue raising to allow them to carry those functions, we can have much different and a much better society where power is largely being exercised under the influence of the people rather than the, under some uh, party leader. You know, when one looks at our system and the, in the power the individual leaders allow to exercise, which I dare say has been exercised, we've almost constructed a fascist state. Mm -hmm. Vincent Alexander here. I, I just want to make a program note that we did invite Commissioner Clement Rohi to come on to the program tonight. He could not. Um, he said he was unavailable, but that he would consider coming on at a later date. Again, we did, um, since we were we are discussing this issue, uh, we did invite Minister um, Commissioner Clement Rohi to um, come on to the program tonight. He said he was unavailable for um, personal reasons, uh, but a promise that he would come on at a later date. Vincent, anything that you want to say that I haven't asked um, before we go? I think you've kind of covered um, everything. If 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 you're asking me for my closing, yes, words, go right ahead. Yes, I, I I say our major problem in this country political culture, that we have a dysfunctional psych, a psych which sees politics as uh, Machiavellian, uh, outmaneuvering each other, sorting uh, oneself over the will uh, of the people. That, that is the major issue which has to be addressed. If we address that issue, then we will be on our way. Uh, the question is, how do we address it? I think that there is the possibility that um, if we approach our legal uh, framework, institutional framework differently, then we could uh, restrain our what seems to be our any behavior patterns. And over time, over time, we can be differently acculturated in terms of how we see politics, therefore in terms of how we practice politics and therefore be able to be more uh, patriotic and more objective uh, in the conduct of public and national affairs. Vincent Alexander, um, tonight here, um, weighing in on GCOM, on uh, electoral system, electoral politics, political culture, and our governance system. Vincent, thank you very much for coming through again. You're welcome. And uh, to you, the audience, uh, as usual, thank you all for staying with us. Tomorrow night, we are going to be um, celebrating the 99th birth anniversary of Brother UC Kwayana. I'm going to have a panel here tomorrow night. Um, Dr. Kimani Nehusi, I know, is on that panel. Um, Dr. Um, Westmas. Nigel Westmus is going to be on, um, and I think a couple of other people, but um, we are going to be celebrating our Brother UC's uh, birthday on the program here tomorrow night. So see you all. Please come out in large numbers for us to pay our respects and celebrate long life, longevity of one of our important leaders. Um, again, thank you all very much for staying with us. Mm -hmm.